So hello everyone, thank you for, for sticking with me till the, well, till the almost end. There's a keynote speaker after me, so we're almost done, but I really appreciate you still being here for me. So again, my name is Nicole Damon. Uh, rhymes with Matt Damon, it's not Matt Damon, unfortunately, would be richer. Um, behind me, I've got my research team, well, my colleagues working with me. I'm a PhD student at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, and yeah, Omaha. <laughs> I, um, you're going to love this presentation, this is great. So I, um, all of us, I work in a, uh, in a research team called Bridge Lab, and we're basically a bunch of different researchers who are from all different fields, but we all work towards making technology a positive experience for everyone. And that ranges from uh, doing experiments, doing interviews, using surveys, and also testing models. So we do, we, we do everything, basically. Um, but today I would like to talk to you a little bit more about survey design and I want to do that through the use of a couple stories because I feel that, like the panelists said earlier, language is one of the most important tools that we have and it's very important that we think about, that we consciously think about the ways that we use that. Um, and also academia sometimes gets a little bit of a bad rap where they think like, oh, we're just in an ivory tower. Um, but I, I found that that's actually not the case. Um, when I started in this field, I didn't know very much about survey design, but then actually as I kept working on it, I suddenly realized that it's all around us. So for example, about three weeks ago, one of my, I went for lunch with one of my friends, and um, she's a huge Game of Thrones fan. So, so she, um, she sits down with me and she goes, are you going to buy an HBO subscription and watch Game of Thrones? And normally, my brain would have gone, yes, because I want to see all my characters die. <laughs> but then I realized, I cannot actually answer this question. You asked me two things. You said, do you want to buy an HBO subscription? And in my case, that's no, because, well, us, us Dutchies are kind of cheap, so no. Um, and do you want to watch Game of Thrones? Hell yeah. So like, what do you want me to do? Um, in survey design, we call this a compound question or a double-barreled question. And um, as you can see, they're very tricky because especially in, in American language, it's so easy for us to say things that seem like they're one thing. Uh, let's go for dinner and watch a movie. How much did you enjoy the food and drinks? Like, these are two things. And the use of and makes this obvious, but only because I've written it down for you here. If I just speak it and if I speak it quickly, then we almost filter this out. And this can be very tricky, right? If I were a survey designer and I work for HBO, even if the answer is 80% of the people said yes, then what did they actually say yes to? Yes, I want to buy HBO. Yes, I want to watch Game of Thrones. Or yes, I want to buy HBO and watch Game of Thrones. And the same problem is if I had said no, none of these results actually mattered. So this means that this entire data set is useless, have to throw it away. So you've wasted your company's money you wasted your own time, and you've paid, wasted other people's time for taking their time to help you. Now you've got to do it all again. Right? So this, this has a lot of impact. Um, so like I said before, I'm Dutch. And, oh no, sorry. <laughs> Some people actually have an advantage with this, which is us non-native speakers, because we had to learn the language, so we are a little bit more sensitive to these things. Um, so yeah, I'm Dutch. And when I moved to the US two years ago, um, people told me, like, you know, now that you're moving, you actually need to get a car. And I, I was like 22 at the time, I didn't even have my driver's license. This is an oddity to most of you. Um, but for me, I, I thought, no, come on, like, Omaha is a big city, right? Come on, how bad can this really be? Um, so, you know, I mean, people can already guess where this is going, but little did I know. So I packed my bag flew like 12 hours to reach Omaha, got out of the airport with my two suitcases and realized, damn, these people were right. <laughs> Unfortunately, there were no buses or trains that could bring me from the, train uh, from the airport to the city center. I've traveled through Europe a couple, year, a couple times and I'd never, ever encountered this before. I was shocked. Sorry, I was completely shocked. Uh, so, <laughs> thankfully, you guys did have taxis, otherwise I would have been stranded and that would have been a very unfortunate study abroad semester. 
So I learned my lesson and I thought, okay, fine, fine, I'll go to the DMV, pass the stupid tests, fill in some forms and, you know, wait a couple hours, pay the people. So yeah, this didn't go as smoothly, smoothly as I thought either. Uh, as I went to sit down, the, the employee told me and said, excuse me, ma'am, you can only fill in one option. And I was like, what do, you, what do you mean one option? And they said, well, you cannot actually be two races. And I thought, excuse me? Um, my father is 100% Dutch. My mother is 100% Chinese. Uh, what? <laughs> I was genuinely stumped. I did not know what to do. Um, first of all, um, checkboxes typically mean multiple choice. Like you've, done, you've all done exams before, you've all done surveys before. We see square boxes. This means multiple choice. Don't let me, don't give me a single choice in a multiple box, please. This is like survey best practices. You can Google these. They're relatively easy to implement. And second, why can I not be too racist? <laughs> I'm still a little bit stunned by this. Um, because I, I just generally did not know what to do. Because if I were to say I am other, then this creates a whole uh, large category of other people. Uh, now, I'm pretty sure none of us are aliens, but I, we'll get to that. Um, it creates a category that we can't do anything with. Like, there's a reason we fill in these surveys. There's a reason we make them. But if I get a category that's this large and it's other, then what is the purpose of me actually going out and asking people for data? Now, if I had filled in white or Asian, then we actually get a completely different picture. And now we get something that's, in my opinion, even worse. Now we say, OK, this looks pretty decent. But now we have a whole bunch of people, because I'm pretty sure I'm not the only mixed heritage person, that are scattered across these other groups, but we don't know where they are. And like we said, we, like we saw earlier with the panelists, we cite, or like we mentioned studies that have done before. We say this and this many people do this. We see this and many, many people enrolled in that. But if we don't actually get an extra accurate picture of these numbers, then how can we have any trust in the results and in the findings of these data points? And well, as a researcher, it's kind of my duty to be diligent and to be systematic and to make sure that we get as close to this as possible. And this is just very risky because I think that in this case we now think that we are close to the truth, but we actually are not. Now you all have been very kind so far. Normally when I say I'm Dutch, uh, the first question I get is, so Nicole, when I go to Amsterdam, what is the best place to buy weed? I genuinely don't know what makes me look like a drug dealer or a drug user. I, I did take a shower, I promise. Like, I don't know why. Um, but this question stumps me for multiple reasons. Um, one, what makes you think it's okay to ask me something this personal? Like, we met five seconds ago. Like, I don't ask you how much you make last year. So don't do the same in survey design. Like, when you want to know these difficult questions, like I'm not saying you can't ever ask me, but all I'm saying is that maybe think about the way you ask this question and also maybe um, introduce it a little bit later in the conversation. Like I don't go up to random people and ask sensitive questions, so don't do the same in your surveys. It's kind of applying common sense. You'd be surprised. The second thing that bugs me is um, the assumption that I'm from Amsterdam like, I know that my country is nowhere near the size of the US. Um, with, we are actually between Omaha and, and uh, Des Moines. That's the end of my country, if you drive. Um, so I, I can understand the confusion. But like we said, like we saw in the, the talk earlier, if you're not sure about something, then just ask it. Um, surveys are pretty cool nowadays. And you can actually even, you can thread questions. So if I ask you, what is your favorite hot beverage, and then you say, I love tea, then you can, you can create your survey in such a way that, I will, that it will never show you stuff about coffee, because I just said I don't like coffee, so why would you ask me questions about this? So I think this is something that's really neat. Um. OK. 
Okay, so for my last story, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about academia versus, re uh, versus research. Because me being in a PhD program, or basically anyone studying, the question usually is, what do you want to do afterwards? And then there's this assumption that it will be industry or academia. And I've really, really struggled with this for a long time. Um, because I am, as you could tell by the introduction, a broadly interested, like, I'm interested in many different topics. I, I, it's hard for me to say I like this one thing and this one thing for the rest of my life. And I think that that's also where, um, where the world is going to. We don't have 30 long, 30 year long careers anymore. We will be switching companies, we'll be switching careers. We need to learn skills all the time. So why, why are you asking me something? Like, why are you asking me to pick the rest of my life like, when I barely know what I want to do for dinner tomorrow? Like, this is kind of hard. Um, so I, 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 I did what I do best. I, I went to Google and I went researching. I went through Scholar. Um, I asked other people. And after a long time, I realized that it's actually not my fault. I think that the, that the problem is more on the question itself. Um, by setting the question, we lead the question in such a way that it assumes, that it assumes to go in a certain direction, whereas actually it doesn't have to be the case. Um, life is really not a multiple choice question. Um, if you had told me five years ago that I would be doing a PhD in the US, I would have called you crazy. Uh, one, I was a psychology major. <laughs> I dropped out of IT because I thought it was stupid. <laughs> Clearly, I changed my mind. Um, it was also nothing what I expected that it was. And I also never thought I would actually make it to the US. So yay, here I am. <laughs> um, so yeah, I really, I really think that it's hard to, to come up with one answer. And I think that we should, um, we should be open to multiple options. Because what we saw earlier also, interdisciplinarity is only becoming more important. I've got professors who have multiple jobs across multiple acad acad academic institutes. Some of them, they have their own, their own consultancy on the side. Uh, some of them work full-time in industry, but also have a teaching career. Like, there is no, there is no either or in this question anymore. And I think the same we see uh, bet between, between fields, right? Even though I do IT, most of my work is in design. Most of my work is with, well, users and psychology and behavioral stuff. Like, I barely touch code. Um, but my PhD is in IT. And I, I think that's very exciting. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I would like to round up by saying that if there's one thing that you remember from my talk um, is that if, your ans if their answer doesn't make sense to you, then think about the question that you've asked them and how you can change it so that it makes more sense to them. Because the point of doing surveys is to understand your user. If they give you nonsensical answers, then there's something about the question that you ask them that does not make sense to them, which by itself is a learning experience, right? Maybe you've used jargon that you didn't know was jargon. These are the things that I discussed in my talk, but I would be very happy to take any other questions. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>